Okay, so um, the talk that I'm giving today is actually based on an article that came out last fall in the International Journal of Constitutional Law, which is a follow-on to the 2012 article that Baki cited. And I was invited by symposium directors at a center there to um, offer a more detailed analysis specifically of a set of controversial uh, constitutional court decisions. And particularly because those decisions don't get translated into English, they asked if I could lay out the legal reasoning or the jurisprudential approach that the court had taken in those particular cases. So I had discussed the controversy about the cases and their upshot in the underlying article. And this article does a kind of more engaged reading of the jurisprudence that emerged and the reasons why that represented a precursor to an amendment package that was then introduced, the constitutional amendment package in 2010. So that's where the paper comes from, but I'm going to first set the scene for you of why this matters, what's important about it, if anything, um, the story I'm going to tell, and then how it links to a current crisis in Turkey, which is subsequent to the publication of that article, which came out again in the fall of 2013. But there's a current, a contemporary crisis about judicial independence in Turkey, and all of the thing I'm going to discuss is a sort of set of um, conflicts, controversies, um, arguments about what judicial independence means. And I happen to think that there are some important and interesting lessons to be drawn from the Turkish case to answer it for comparative lawyers or people interested in comparative political science or institutional design of apex courts, what judicial independence might mean in situations where you have democratic transition or democratic consolidation. Okay, so, just, so I'm gonna set the scene. I'm gonna tell you the story of the article and the cases and controversies and amendments that followed them, and then I'm gonna tie it to the contemporary scene in Turkey, and then hopefully we can have a discussion about what the meaning is of judicial independence, why we value it as an institutional design mechanism in democracies. Um, okay, so to set the scene then, I, there was a constitutional referendum in 2010 in Turkey that represented a large package of amendments that were simultaneously put to a vote of the public, and they covered a whole range of issues. I'll come to the substance of the package in the substance of the talk, but it was everything from reducing the jurisdiction of military courts to improving gender equality to the rights of the disabled, all kinds of things. And packaged in with those things was a judicial reform proposal. And uh, people were up in arms at the time of the package, claiming that this was the end of the independence of the judiciary. And more importantly, that this was court packing. That what the government was doing is dress, using window dressing of individual rights and various things that people were gonna vote in favor of in order to get in, sneak through the Trojan horse of court packing, and that this was basically the end of judicial independence in Turkey. And I thought that was a really interesting moment to intervene in, and I wrote a very short piece for something called Middle East Report um, about my analysis of why a better reading of the amendments related to judicial reform would be to describe them as court unpacking, and why in fact they corresponded to and indeed were more or less directly one for one um, consistent with the advice that was given by the European Union towards accession and the Venice Commission on basic standards of judicial independence. Now, what was even more interesting from my perspective was the firestorm that this very short article created. So I write on controversial topics, Israel, Palestine, Iranian nuclear program, you know, all kinds of things where one expects controversy. But here's a short piece in a relatively obscure left progressive venue about a set of amendments and suddenly my family's up in arms and, you know, most people I know in Turkey are up in arms and people just think, you know, you're engaging in what amounts to something like class treason. Uh, and the question is why? What was so threatening about these reforms? How is it possible that I, as a you know, trained lawyer, who's also done a PhD, who studies comparative law, who's written on it in other contexts and so forth, could either have misread so badly this package, or at least misread so badly the political context, that what seemed to me like a relatively straightforward analysis of the institutional design function of a set of amendments could have produced such a furor. And also, so then I decided to explore that further. I wrote a longer piece in 2012. I was invited to do this symposium in 2013, uh, and so on. And then now we're in a really interesting moment to just set the scene a little further, in which, once again, um, very similar parties are up in arms in fear that the independence of the judiciary is, is again at risk. Now, note that what that has to mean at a minimum is that the judiciary has remained independent somehow between 2010 and today, otherwise we wouldn't be having a debate about judicial independence because if the most dire predictions of 2010 had come true, there would no longer be a debate to be had along these lines. So to begin with, one question to ask is, what did the 2010 amendments produce? How might they be related to the moment that we're in now? What does judicial independence mean in these moments of controversy? What is the value that people are seeking to vindicate? Um, so with that sort of background, let me tell you about the court cases 
why I believe they represented a prelude to the constitutional amendment package that I engaged with, and then what the time is that we're at today. So as many of you know, I think many people here have some at least knowledge of the contemporary Turkish context. There's a party that is the governing party in Turkey today that's won three consecutive general elections and is poised very likely to potentially at least be competitive in a fourth general election that we would anticipate sort of at the end of this year, at the beginning of next year, uh, called the AKP, which I'm just going to refer to by that acronym, which is the Turkish acronym, Justice and Development Party, and is understood to be, uh, well, it's described variously as a kind of moderate Islamist party in Turkey or a conservative Christian Democrat style Muslim center-right party um, that's informed by conservative values and so forth. And it's had an interesting trajectory over time. I'm going to invite you to come back to, with me to the moment that they were in in 2007, which begins the story I want to tell, rather than the moment that they're in now. But I will begin first by signposting that I deem the AKP as a party to be what I call um, accidental Democrats or accidental liberals or both. And I use these terms advisedly, um, and several people in this room who had conversations with me during the day today have already heard me use these terms, but let me just define why I say this. I believe many, and many people believe, that there have been instances in which the AKP has undertaken reforms that in and of themselves were intrinsically important and had great value for liberalizing or democratizing the political and constitutional order in Turkey, but they may have undertaken these reforms tactically in order to pursue a, a strategy not related to either liberalizing or democratizing necessarily, and I don't call it tactical Democrats or tactical liberals because I'm not even convinced necessarily that the tactic was understood to be democratic or liberal by the party. It was a tactic that happened to remove an obstacle that was inconvenient in their path on the either path to legislative reforms that they were substantively committed to or institutional reforms that they were substantively committed to for other reasons. So instead of calling them tactical Democrats, I want to say accidental because it really is an interest convergence story more than anything. It's that they happen to have a set of interests in certain kinds of institutional changes or legislative changes, and it turned out that there were also independent grounds to justify those changes, whether or not even tactically they were interested in those independent grounds. So if we return then to 2007, we're at a moment when I think their identity as at least accidental Democrats or liberalizers was much clearer. I think today one can really argue whether or not they any longer have any interest convergence story that yields a liberal or a democratic tendency, at least from the Prime Minister himself, and there are arguments about the degree to which he represents the rest of the party. But in 2007, you had a moment in which the, a new president had to be selected in Turkey. And the constitutionally prescribed mechanism for the selection of a president was not through direct elections, but rather through a series of sort of complicated procedures by which the parliament would um, develop candidates and then select one among them. And those procedures involved voting under supermajority rules in two rounds, and if after two rounds, uh, no single candidate was able to gain a supermajority, then simple majority rules in the third and fourth rounds. Now, the AKP, for a variety of reasons in 2007, had a majority in, um, in the Turkish General Grand National Assembly, which is going to call it the Turkish Parliament, uh, and they knew as a result that their candidate would be able to be selected in the third and fourth round of voting, but was going to be unlikely to be able, they were not able to build a coalition at the time with the composition of the parliament to get their candidates selected in the first two rounds. The opposition parties decided that, or the opposition party rather at that moment, decided that their strategy was gonna be the following, to just boycott the rounds of voting and make an argument to the Turkish Constitutional Court that there is a super quorum requirement in order for a candidate to be selected. So while the candidate needs only a super majority, the argument was you have to have a larger quorum, a super quorum, in order to convene the casting of the ballots. Now, this was intentional with past practice of the parliament. In fact, a previous president, Turgut Özal, had been selected over the boycott of opposition parties, and no one had deemed that that was impermissible under the same constitution. And so people thought this didn't really hold very much water as a legal theory, but nonetheless, the opposition party pursued this before the Turkish Constitutional Court and prevailed. So this is really the beginning moment of the story I want to tell of controversial constitutional court cases that set the prelude for the reform agenda that I then engage with. Um, so the Constitutional Court upheld the logic that the Constitution could be read to have such a super quorum rule, notwithstanding past practice and the plain text of the Constitution. Uh, and the effect of that would be to give the minority party an effective block, because then you would never be able to select. And in fact, the rules had been written at a moment when the goal was to very rapidly select a president and not create any kind of impasse. So the likely notion that this is a fair interpretation of what the drafters had intended is also relatively weak. But it produced a kind of challenge. 
And the challenge was backstopped uh, because the court was backstopped by the military, which also at the same time convened a set of press conferences to basically declare that the presidential candidate selected by the governing party was unacceptable. In part, it was understood, although this wasn't the content of the military's specific claim, but that the fact that his wife wore a headscarf made it unacceptable from the Turkish political and constitutional order's perspective that she would sit as a first lady in the presidential um, house and so forth. So the AKP decided to pursue a strategy that would demonstrate to the military at minimum, if not the courts, that they had the electoral mandate to support their presidential candidate selection by calling early elections. So just as by way of background here, this was actually an interesting move on their part because they had happened to benefit from another institutional design feature of the Turkish constitutional order, which is embedded not in the constitution but in a political party's law, but nonetheless has very significant effects on the capacity to convene a representative legislature in Turkey, and that is a threshold rule of 10%. So there's a national 10% threshold that only parties that are able to get more than 10% of the national vote are able to be seated in parliament. This threshold was designed by the original drafters of the Constitution of the Political Parties Law primarily to exclude minority parties at the fringes that they understood to be Islamist parties, Kurdish parties, fringe left parties, and so forth. But as it happened in the first elections the AKP competed in, because there was tremendous loss of confidence in the center-right and center-left parties, because the political spectrum had become quite fragmented, and because voters were basically engaging in an act of no confidence generally in that moment, only two parties made it past the threshold, one of which was the AKP, the very kind of party the threshold had been written to exclude. So when that happens and you have two parties that capture, let's say, 52% of the vote share, but are the only ones that get above the 10% threshold, 100% of the seats get distributed by the ratio of votes that they each won, so they get a much larger share of votes, obviously, in Parliament than the underlying vote share that they receive. And as a result, the AKP had been the beneficiary of the threshold that had received a huge share of seats in Parliament. So to call early elections is to give up an obvious advantage that they had received in the last round and take the risk that even if they managed to retain their party share, they would still lose seats in Parliament and potentially not be able to put their candidate forward. So they said, we're willing to take this risk. We're going to go forward with this. There's an obstacle constitutionally to our ability to proceed with presidential selection. It's been backstopped by the military. It's time to test whether we have the electoral mandate to pursue our selection. They went to the um, ballots and they indeed increased their vote share, although they lost the proportion of seats that they had in Parliament because a third party made it past the threshold in that particular election, um, and of course independent candidates that then also form a block of their own. In any case, so they ended up coming out stronger in terms of vote share and only slightly weaker in terms of number of parliamentary seats. And this did open the path. This removed the obstacle and the, basically the, the, the Parliament went forward with the three rounds of balloting, the same candidate was in fact selected for the presidency, but it illustrated the first of what began, uh, what became a series of confrontations with the Constitutional Court in particular, in which I would say a, a relatively weak legal interpretation was used in order to backstop obstacles to the governing party's goals in terms of its ability to pursue either something like the installation of its own preferred candidate or its legislative agenda. So while that had been characterized at the time, and again, now we're talking in sort of ancient history terms because 2007, as compared to where we are with this party today, seems like a very long ago starting point, but it set the stage for the next set of very severe um, challenges before the Turkish Constitutional Court. So the party had um, run on a platform of constitutional reform, and this is something that's been broadly popular in Turkey as a general matter because the existing constitution was written in 1982 by um, a constitution drafting committee selected by the military junta that had accomplished the coup in 1980, and um, it set the stage for transfer to civilian governance, but under very strict um, constraints governed by the military. Now that constitution had gone through a tremendous number of amendment packages already by the time we're in 2007, 2008. From 1987 to 2005, including under the AKP, so 2002 to 2005 period, a number of packages of amendments had passed that had altered substantially one-third of the Constitution. So one-third of the original 1982 Constitution had already been revised in order to improve its liberal credentials, essentially civilianize, remove various forms of military tutelage, restrict, to some extent, military court jurisdiction, and other interventions to improve individual rights protections and so forth. Um, but the idea that this whole Constitution had to be 
done away with and a new constitution that was more in keeping with European Union standards, more in keeping with best practices generally in the international system, more protective of individual rights, less permissive of military court jurisdiction, et cetera, was a widely held belief beyond AKP circles. And so they had had this platform and they convened a constitution drafting commission of five really eminent constitutional law scholars in Turkey, chaired by uh, Arvin Özbudun, who had been who had taught at Princeton and Columbia and a number of places, was well regarded internationally as a constitutional law expert, had served on the Venice Commission, and was all around thought to be a very liberal, a person with deep liberal commitments, as the chair of a committee that drafted a constitution that was then to be submitted to the AKP party, vetted there, submitted to parliament, submitted for public debate, and ultimately voted. That was supposed to be the process that was going to put in place. But that new draft constitution project got derailed almost immediately. First, because the opposition political parties opposed the process that had been specified, the notion of a drafting commission that had been selected by the AKP to produce the first draft was deemed problematic, notwithstanding the liberal credentials of the drafters. Uh, and secondly, the AKP decided that in order to clear the path for the new constitution project, they had to first um, address themselves to an underlying impediment that had been in place for some time, which was the confrontation with the various political parties and the political spectrum over the headscarf question. So they decided to move forward with a standalone set of amendments that would address the constitutional basis for amending the headscarf ban at universities in order to remove that very controversial question from the broader problem, package of introducing a new constitution. So in other words, by the time the new constitution draft would be proposed, the existing constitutional order would already have addressed the headscarf problem, and that would no longer be the way in which the new constitution project would be characterized. And just again to backdrop for backtrack for a moment, the widespread support for lifting of the headscarf ban was well established in this period. So polls in 2008 and 2009, the relevant period in question, showed something on the order of 70% of Turkish women and 65% of Turkish men supportive of the lifting of the headscarf ban, which again is numbers much much higher than any constituency share that the AKP itself could boast at the polls. So this was a widely popular initiative which had been attempted multiple times previously through ordinary legislation and failed because of the Turkish Constitutional Court's weaving of the legislation as inconsistent with the requirements of constitutional secularism. So the AKP decided to advance two amendments, constitutional amendments in 2008, uh, to Article 10 and Article 42 of the Constitution. So the first was on equal access to public services. So they basically amended the provision to say that across the board, all public services had to be made available to Turkish citizens on, on a basis of equality. And then in Article 42, which had to do with the right to education, they specified that deprivations of the right to education must be based in law. These were the amendments that they proposed. So facially speaking, one can't describe these as obviously anti-secular amendments. They did, though, however, it was very clear in the debates in Parliament and the debates around the drafting, that the purpose of these amendments was to lift the headscarf ban. How? The headscarf ban on, in universities was actually upheld by um, administrative regulatory order of the Higher Education Council and the support of the rectors or presidents of universities in Turkey, and not it had no statutory basis. And so with this constitutional change, the requirement would be in order to maintain the ban, there would have to be a statutory basis, so you would have to get a law through the parliament that could support the ban, and of course that wasn't gonna happen because parliament opposed the ban as a general matter. And AKP was not alone in this. So they were supported by another opposition party, the other party that made it past the threshold in that 2007 election, the MHP, supported these constitutional amendments. And so they were able very easily to overcome all of the kind of procedural requirements for the passage of constitutional amendments. They had something on the order of 80% support within parliament for the amendments themselves. They could easily be adopted. Um, of course, what then happened was the constitutional court agreed to hear a challenge to the constitutional amendments. Now, for those of you who are lawyers in the room, of, of whom I think we have at least two based on the, and several aspiring lawyers based on the um, earlier presentations, you will know that the doctrine of judicial review is typically a doctrine whereby courts engage in judicial review of ordinary legislation by comparison to constitutional requirements. Judicial review of constitutional amendments is something that is several orders uh, qualitatively more um, challenging in terms of how to understand institutional balance of power between institutions under a constitutional order. If the Constitution specifies a particular mechanism, so for example in the United States, that two-thirds of states would have to ratify an amendment in order for the amendment to pass, and you satisfied that constitutional procedure, and you still had a court that was willing to engage in review of the properly passed 
constitutional amendments, this would likely produce a, a form of constitutional challenge in any ordinary constitution. So it's not the case that judicial review elsewhere outside of Turkey encompasses review of constitutional amendments. And indeed, in the Turkish constitution, it is specifically ruled out. So the Turkish constitution specified at that time in Article 148 that there was no power of substantive judicial review of constitutional amendments as a consequence of an experience that had been um, earlier experience in the course of the 1960s and 1970s of earlier instances of the Turkish Constitutional Court reaching to substantive review of amendments that had been ruled out of bounds. The Constitutional Court nonetheless agreed to hear this challenge to the properly enacted constitutional amendments on the grounds that they were in tension with unamendable provisions of the Turkish Constitution, specifically around secularism. So the notion here was if a cut, uh, and I'm sorry, I should say irrevocable. So we have four irrevocable articles in the Turkish Constitution. The court read irrevocable to mean unamendable, to start, and then read unamendable to mean not only that the actual articles themselves may not be amended, but that no amendment may be introduced that may, might be in tension with the spirit of the Constitution engendered by those four articles. So now what this amounts to is the constitutional entrenchment of a particular interpretation of constitutional provisions. Because what you have in terms of constitutional text is four articles that are irrevocable and then a specific constraint that says the constitutional court may only review constitutional amendments for substance where there's a procedural flaw. So one might be able to plausibly give color to the argument that there would be a clear procedural flaw if an amendment purported to revoke irrevocable provisions. Or that there's a procedural flaw if you fail to meet the basic criteria laid out for constitutional amendments under the constitution. But to say that amendments to other provisions produce an effect that itself would endanger the spirit of secularism intended to be guarded by the first four amendments raises a challenge. And the question is, what is the nature of that challenge? So there were a number of arguments that were presented, and again, in the underlying article, but not here, I go through the jurisprudential arguments of the majority of the dissent in this particular case, and they go through many things. For example, the past practice of the court in which the court had declined to substantively re review constitutional amendments under the 1982 constitution when they had been previously challenged, so its own pra past practice, the number of packages that had been passed, so the fact that a third of the constitution had already been repealed and revised before these amendments were proposed and had, had that that had gone forward without challenge was also raised by the dissent. But they were most interested in the underlying logic that was presented by the constitutional court, which inverted the relationship between the legislature and the courts in terms of who can initiate constitutional change and what forms of constitutional change are to be permitted under the Constitution. And this reversal happened not only because the Constitutional Court was willing to hear cases challenging constitutional amendments, review them, not only because they were prepared to um, vindicate an interpretation of the meaning of constitutional articles as a basis to block amendments elsewhere in the Constitution, but also because they proposed a novel theory of when legislatures may engage in constitutional amendment to court. So they said there is a primary and a secondary role that the legislature may play. The primary role, which is as a constituent assembly, can only occur under two circumstances. First, if in fact a constituent assembly has been convened, that's distinct from the parliament and has been endowed with constitutional authority. Or second, if there's been a period of extra political